Hey everyone, in this video, I'm going to be breaking down Fables Volume 5. Last volume, Volume 4, was the epic Battle of Fable Town with all of the wooden soldiers coming, and now we will see the repercussions of that. While this volume is not as epic as last one was, there's still some fun to be had in here. We're going to learn more about Cinderella and her being a spy. We're going to have a Big B in World War II storyline. We're going to see the results of the mayoral election between Prince Charming and King Cole. And we're going to see Snow White and Bigby's children get born. So it should be a fun one. Let's dive into it now. Fables, Volume 5. Fables, Volume 5. Mean Seasons, written by Bill Willingham, art by Mark Buckingham and Tony Akins. Fables, Issue 22, Cinderella Libertine in which we explore something of the secret life of Prince Charming's rather outspoken and rambunctious third wife. In New York City, the three ex-wives of Prince Charming, Snow White, Briar Rose, aka Sleeping Beauty, and Cinderella, all meet for lunch at a fancy restaurant called The Stone Soup. This is a kind of annual tradition for the three ladies. Cinderella talks of their mutual ex-husband, Prince Charming, she says. Say all the horrible stuff you want about him, but he was great in the sack. Snow White. She basically runs Fable Town, and Briar Rose is filthy rich from her fairy blessings. But Cinderella, she seems to be the least successful of the group. She just owns a modest shoe store in town called the Glass Slipper. Cinderella, talking about their ex, says that she got the worst end of the deal with Prince Charming. He actually tried in his marriage with Snow White, and with Briar Rose as well. But by the time he got around to her, he knew that he could never stay with a girl and be happily ever after. So he kind of just dragged her along and took advantage of her. Cinderella says that, you know what? She has every right to be bitter, and she plans to stay that way. Cinderella, while confident and beautiful, throughout this whole lunch, is giving off a vibe of being a spoiled, bitter, angry divorcee with not much else going on in her life except running her lowly shoe store. Eventually, Cinderella excuses herself from their lunch. She says she has a flight to Paris to catch. Briar Rose asks, Oh, you're going to Europe? Again? Your shoe store must be doing better than you let on. Cinderella explains, Oh, it's doing rather poorly, actually. I was never much cut out for being a merchant but I'm spending the rest of the shop's money to treat myself to a vacation before my creditors shut me down. So Cinderella heads off. Now, Cinderella is actually a spy for Big B, going on missions all around the world. Her trip to Paris is just that, secret spy business. Her lonely, bitter divorcee facade is just that. It is subterfuge to throw everyone off on what she is actually doing. We later on see in Paris at a fancy hotel. Cinderella is there. She is meeting another fable called Ichabod Crane. Ichabod Crane is a character from the 1820 story, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. In the original story, he was a tall, lanky schoolmaster who traveled to the town of Sleepy Hollow. He strongly believed in all things supernatural, including the legend of the headless horseman. Crane had a love interest that he tried to court, named Katrina von Tassel. Crane eventually tried unsuccessfully to court her, an action that angered another local man who also wished to marry this Katrina. After supposedly proposing to his love interest and failing, Crane headed home alone one night, when the Headless Horseman appeared and chased him, and then the Headless Horseman threw a pumpkin at him, and Ichabod seemed to mysteriously disappear without a trace. In Fables, Ichabod Crane was the previous deputy mayor of Fable Town, a role in which Snow White now has. In the Wolf Among Us video game, which is set before the Fables comic began, we see some of Ichabod Crane in this role. Ichabod was forced out of the role after some controversy, which will be revealed later in this issue. When Cinderella meets Ichabod, she is all over him. She says, Icky darling, and she kisses him and invites him into her room. Cinderella, this entire time to Ichabod, has pretended to be a loyalist to the adversary. 
But in actuality, she is loyal to Fable Town, and she is merely just trying to sniff out unloyal fables that may betray them. Through the conversation between Cinderella and Ichabod, Ichabod, he admits how much he loves Cinderella, and he wouldn't be selling out Fable Town and all of its secrets to the adversary for anyone else but her. The two of them, they spend the night together, and in the morning, they talk business. Cinderella presents a document to Ichabod for him to sign. She says, This official document guarantees that when my master's forces move in, you will be installed as the Imperial Governor General of this world. And Ichabod, he is happy to sign the documents. He asks Cinderella, And you will be my consort ruling by my side? Cinderella replies, As soon as you make an honest woman out of me. Ichabod, he's going to get a pretty sweet deal if this was a real thing. Sell out Fable Town, but in exchange you get power and you get Cinderella's arm in marriage, a girl that is way out of his league. Cinderella, she continues talking and says, In return for my services to the Empire, my masters promised me a huge court wedding with all the trimmings. Ichabod asks, And the adversary himself will be there? Cinderella replies, You'll perform the ceremony. But Ichabod, you must never again call him by that crude and vulgar name. His loyal subjects, among whom you're now counted, refer to him as the Emperor, not the Adversary. Before they leave their hotel room to go celebrate this new business arrangement, Cinderella tells Ichabod to go take a shower. Ichabod, he does so. Once Ichabod is in the shower and the water is running, Cinderella immediately drops her fake smile and overly happy, lovely demeanor. And she phones Bigby. She says, It's done. He signed it. We'll be out of the room for about an hour. Once Ichabod is out of the shower, him and Cinderella go for a walk by the water. Ichabod, he talks about how he was deputy mayor of Fable Town back in the day for about 150 years, and Snow White served as his assistant, the same as Boy Blue serves as her assistant now. But then he says, and then one day it was all over. Snow White made some false accusations about him sexually harassing her. He said that he tried to kiss her after hours behind locked doors. Ichabod explains this away, he says. It's nonsense, I say. I attempted to express my gratitude for her fine work, and she chose to misinterpret my gesture. Ichabod then says that Snow White also, she falsified evidence against me about me embezzling community funds, and I was forced to resign. She did that so she could get my job, you know. After their walk, they return to the hotel room. They are embracing outside of the door, kissing, as Ichabod fumbles to find the key to their room. Once he does finally unlock the door and they head inside, Cinderella turns cold to Ichabod. Her charade is over now. She pushes Ichabod away and says, I'm afraid the engagement is off, Icky. Boss, meet Ichabod Crane. We see Bigby is there, poring over various files of Ichabod's that Ichabod had collected. Ichabod is confused. He asks Cinderella what's going on. He thought that she worked for the adversary. Ichabod, he then thinks, oh, is Bigby the adversary? Bigby is not the adversary. Bigby answers, don't be an idiot, Crane. I'm exactly who you've always known me to be. I'm loyal to Fable Town. Cinderella's also loyal to Fable Town. The only authentic traitor in this room is you. It was merely a sting operation that him and Cinderella were running. All the evidence of Ichabod's disloyalty to Fable Town is in the briefcase. Cinderella explains to Bigby, he reveals our estimated military strength, and he details all of our tactical magical artifacts, and an analysis of our weapon manufacturing up at the farm, as well as personal reports on each fable living in Fable Town. Bigby, reading from the file, says, I know. I especially enjoyed what he had to say about me. Called me a mongrel, a whipped cur. And then there's also the extended rape fantasy about snow. Bigby definitely ain't gonna like that. Ichabod, he pleads and he tries to lie and he tries to squirm out of this. But then he eventually just tries to run for the door. But Cinderella stops him and punches him back. Bigby, he tells Cinderella to wait outside for him while... He and Crane have a chat. Bigby and Ichabod are alone now. Ichabod asks, what's to be done with him? Drag him back to Fable Town in disgrace? 
Bigby, he replies. No, like you said, I have no authority here. I'll have to let you go soon. Do me a favor and look out that window. Tell me when you see Cinderella appear down in the courtyard. After staring out the window, Ichabon, he says that, oh, there she is now. And Bigby picks up a statue in the room and bashes Ichabod in the back of the skull with it, killing him. Bigby, once he cleans up and sets the scene, he leaves and joins Cinderella outside. Cinderella asks if there's going to be a trial, and Bigby answers, If there was, I'd have to reveal you work for me, and I can't allow that. I need at least one agent completely off the books that no one knows about but me. Bigby explains that he staged the scene to make Crane's death look like an accident, at least enough to fool the French police here. The two of them, they then share a cab back to the airport, and they fly home. Fables Issue 28, War Stories Part 1, Dog Company. We learned in a previous volume that Bigby left Fable Town and fought in both World War I and World War II. Well, in this storyline, we will be learning about Bigby's time during World War II. Bigby, in the current day, goes to visit an old war buddy named Sean Duffy. Sean is an old man now, dying of cancer. Duffy gives Bigby a book he wrote about all their adventures in World War II. Duffy was never going to publish it and betray Bigby's secrets. Besides, who would believe his story anyway? But he wrote the story down for his own enjoyment, and with him dying, he wants Bigby to have it. With that, we begin with a flashback to 1944, to Nazi Germany, where we see Duffy's story. Duffy and his fellow soldiers parachuted behind enemy lines. Then, they hid and waited, waited for three days. On the fourth day, Bigby showed up, wearing a white suit. Bigby was just a civilian to most of the troops, but he did know Sergeant Harp from before. Sergeant Harp was the one leading this group of soldiers. He shakes Bigby's hand. They worked together before, and Harp fully trusts Bigby. Well, Bigby begins leading these men. With his incredible senses, including smell, he could detect any Nazi soldiers near their position. So Bigby, he expertly navigated them through the forests to where they needed to go. Bigby, he knew exactly where all the enemies were and how to navigate around them. Bigby, he would even go and grab food for all the soldiers on their downtime when they were resting. As they got closer to their objective, Bigby and Sergeant Harp decided to go undercover and they dressed as Nazi officers in disguise. Bigby, he then led the troops through a secret tunnel underneath a castle that was filled with Nazis. One of the soldiers asked Sergeant Harp, what was so important here in this castle? And Harp answered, Well, according to our intelligence boys, the Nazis have some sort of secret weapon development going on that may prolong the war a year or more. We're here to throw a monkey wrench into their schemes. Bigby, he has some of the troops stay behind as he goes on alone. Bigby, he enters into a scientist's lab where we see a Nazi general and two doctors named Dr. Welschler and another named Dr. Sigund von Abensberg und Tron. <laughs> the Nazis are there in that lab and they are working on bringing Frankenstein to life. Fables Issue 29, War Stories Part 2, Frankenstein vs. the Wolfman. As the scientists are trying to awaken Frankenstein, Bigby transforms into his wolf form and attacks them all. Frankenstein does wake up mid-attack, though, and starts fighting and choking Bigby. Meanwhile, in the castle, the American troops that Bigby traveled with are now in a firefight with Nazis and they are all shooting at each other. Bigby and Frankenstein are battling intensely all over the lab. Beakers are being broken, doors are being destroyed. Sergeant Harp, who was undercover as a Nazi, was walking among some other Nazi soldiers and then he turns on them and starts killing a whole lot of them with the element of surprise. Eventually, though, after taking many soldiers down, he gets shot himself, though. Bigby and Frankenstein, they're continuing to tumble all over the place. They fall down some stairs. Frankenstein boots Bigby in the face. Bigby bites into Frankenstein's leg. In the end, though, 
Bigby grabs onto Frankenstein's head. And Bigby, he pulls and he pops the head right off of Frankenstein's body. Well, that is the mission that Bigby came here to do. Some new Nazi soldiers flood into the room. They all tell Bigby to freeze. These troops are special. They are armed with silver bullets, which could kill Bigby. Sergeant Harp, elsewhere, injured from his bullet wound, finds the rest of his men. But when he sees that Bigby didn't make it out, he tells his men, I'm going after him. We'll find our own way out. If we make it, we'll rendezvous back with you at the Burned Inn. The Nazi general has Bigby tied up. He tells Bigby that this was all just a ruse to lure him here, specifically. The Nazis heard rumors of Bigby and his exploits, about this unstoppable commando wolfman sowing fear and panic among their forces. The Nazi general knew that if the Americans got wind of their Frankenstein monster building plans, they would send someone here to stop it. And they figured Bigby would be sent, and sure enough, he was. The Nazis, now that they have captured Bigby, are planning on creating themselves a whole battalion of Nazi werewolves. The general has his scientist take some of Bigby's blood. The doctor scientist lady inspecting the blood says, Your blood contains the lycanthropic virus. It will be a simple matter to develop a serum from it, with which we can infect our selected subjects. I want to take a step back and give a little explanation here. So, lycanthropy has to do with werewolves. And I want to answer the question now, is Bigby a werewolf or not? So, Bigby's mother was a wolf, and Bigby's father was the North Wind, who kind of looks human. Bigby was in no way born a werewolf. He actually did have the ability to shapeshift between human and wolf, but he refused to learn and be anything but a wolf for so long that he was stuck in wolf form. But later on in Bigby's life, Snow White cut Bigby with a lycanthropic stained knife, which basically cursed Bigby with a werewolf-type power. Except, instead of being a human first and turning into a werewolf, Bigby is kind of like a reverse werewolf. He's a wolf first, and because of the lycanthropic virus, he can turn human, thus granting him the ability to change into human form at will. So, Bigby's human appearance is not due to a glamour. It's a little convoluted, but that is your explanation. So the Nazis here, with Bigby's blood, have now access to this lycanthropic virus. And with it, they can create themselves some Nazi werewolves. But luckily, Sergeant Harp came back for Bigby to save him. Harp shoots and kills all the Nazis in the room, and then he frees Bigby. Sergeant Harp and Bigby are preparing to leave the castle, but Harp is so injured he tells Bigby he won't be able to make it, and the castle is going to blow up in seconds. He's gonna have to stay behind, but he wants Bigby to make it out alive. He tells Bigby to go, but he asks for one last favor. He says, tell each of my girlfriends I mentioned only her at the end. Bigby, he decides to grab Frankenstein's severed head and puts it in a backpack, and then Bigby jumps from the castle window and escapes, moments before it explodes. Bigby then returned to the rest of the US troops that he traveled with. And Bigby, he makes them promise to keep his secret, and in exchange, he will save their lives and get them home. The men agreed. Bigby, he turned into a wolf, and he walked them all to safety. None of them ever revealed Bigby's secret. We jump back to the current day now in Fable Town. Bigby tells Buffkin to put Sean Duffy's book in their library, find an appropriate place for it. Bigby then says hello to Frankenstein. Frank is still alive, but only a decapitated talking head being kept in a tiny bird cage. Frankenstein and Bigby seem to be on good, friendly terms now. Frankenstein even regularly has Buffkin or Boy Blue read books to him. Bigby says, I tried to talk Snow into letting me put a TV in here for you, but she won't have it. Frankenstein explains that apparently they tried that about 10 years back, but it was a disaster. Buffkin kept going crazy with the remote, and it nearly drove Frankenstein insane. Bigby asks Frank if he wants anything else. Frankenstein says, well, I'm awfully thirsty, Biggs. 
Bigby tells Frank that's just a phantom thirst. The water would just run out of your neck and rust out the bottom of the cage. As Bigby leaves Frankenstein, he tells him to take care of himself. And then, later on, Bigby goes to visit his friend that has since passed, Sean Duffy. Bigby is visiting Sean's grave, and Bigby tells him to take care of himself too. Fables, issue 30, Mean Seasons, part 1 of 4, The Cruel Hot Summer, in which the election is decided, snow gives birth, a blunder is revealed, threats are made, and an investigation is begun. The previous three issues were diversions from the main storyline, but now we are picking up on the threads that we last saw in Volume 4. Volume 4 ended with Snow White's water breaking, and she was preparing to give birth. So now we see Bigby rushing to the Knights of Malta Hospital. Snow White is in her second day of labor. Prince Charming, King Cole, and Boy Blue are in the waiting room. When Bigby returns, he tells Boy Blue that he can go and vote now. Today is not only the day when Snow White is giving birth, it is also the day when the mayoral election of Fabletown takes place. Boy Blue tells Bigby he already did vote. King Cole and Prince Charming immediately ask, Who'd you vote for? Bigby tells them, Settle down, boys, before you start foaming at the mouth. And while all of that is going on, back in the Woodland Luxury Apartments building, we see some of the voting for the mayoral races taking place. In the voting line, Cinderella asks Flycatcher, Who's he voting for? Flycatcher says that he's writing in Snow White's name. Miss Muffet, ever the gossip, chimes in and says, how can you do that? What with all of her tawdry adventures? And now having a child out of wedlock? Scandalous! Back at the hospital, Snow White has been in labor for 42 hours. Finally though, Snow White gives birth to her child. She finally thinks her labor is over, but the doctor tells her another child is coming. Snow White asks, how could you wait until now to tell me? The doctor explains because I didn't know. The extremely magical nature of your pregnancy played royal havoc with my sonogram and other diagnostic equipment. And judging by the degree of stomach distension, we might want to plan on more than just the two of them. Snow White asks, am I having triplets? The doctor hints it might be even more. Snow White annoyed asks, a litter? I'm having a litter of children? Up at the farm, the Animal Fables are voting in the mayoral election as well. It is explained to them that if they do not have opposable thumbs, they can simply designate someone to fill in their ballot for them in their presence. Back at the hospital, after some more kids pop out of Snow White, she is still delivering more children. Bigby in the waiting room is stressed out because he senses how much pain Snow White is in and how she is at the end of her endurance. Later that day, King Cole and Prince Charming discuss politics with their various allies as they head back to the Woodland Luxury Apartments building. We see all of Fabletown is under construction, still being rebuilt from the battle with the wooden soldiers we saw in Volume 4. Later that night, the new mayor of Fabletown has been decided in the election. The winner of the election is... Prince Charming in a landslide victory! Of course, Prince Charming won. He made so many promises, he was assured victory. Prince Charming is having a large celebration with the various fables in attendance. He is dancing and extremely jolly and full of himself. Cinderella and Briar Rose, gossiping about their ex-husband, comment, Ugh, he'll be impossible to live with now. Cinderella adds, which you probably no longer have to do. My bet is he'll be in the penthouse, betting naive Fabletown girls before the hour is out. Jack Horner is talking to Kate, the All-Seer, and they discuss the repercussions of Prince Charming winning. Kay says to Jack, I imagine this must make you happy, Jack. With a new regime in power, learning the ropes, it will create many new opportunities for you to sow your mischief. Jack replies, You'd think so, wouldn't you? But I think this place is now going to hell in a handbasket. We had a good long run, but Fable Town is over. Done. Finished. Kay responds, Perhaps so, but after the corruption set in, 
Rome still took 500 years to fall. We may have some good days yet. Jack replies, not for me, Kay. I'm already gone. Where is Jack Horner going to go if he leaves Fabletown? That is an adventure we will see in Volume 6. At the hospital, Bigby is overjoyed that he has six children. Three boys, Ambrose, Connor, and Darian, and three girls, Blossom, Winter, and Therese. Only one of the children looks human, though. The other five all look very wolf-like. Snow White is disappointed, she says, that since only one of the children looks human, they will have to go live on the farm to raise them, which Bigby is not allowed to go to. Back at Prince Charming's election win party, Prince Charming, still as cocky as ever, goes over to the witches and he tells them, you're all going to be very rich soon, and they need to start mass-producing glamour so he can fulfill all of his campaign promises. This is when Fro Totenkinder drops a information bomb on Prince Charming. She explains, Silly Prince, the main reason we charge so dearly for our services is to drastically cut the demand down to what we can actually manage. We're already nearly at the limit of our ability to craft spells. We can't provide many more glamours and no new transformations. We aren't able to mass-produce our workings like some Monday factory. Now don't you wish you consulted us first? Before making that the central issue of your campaign? Prince Charming, he initially thought that he could just throw all of Bluebeard's money at these witches. They could mass produce all of these glamours and everyone would be happy. It turns out though that money was not the problem. It's actually a matter of resources. The witches can literally only do so much and they are already pretty much pushed to their maximum. Prince Charming, he walks off, realizing he is incredibly screwed then. Everyone in Fable Town and the farm is going to be pissed at him when he doesn't come through on all the promises he made. King Cole, sitting in his penthouse, which we will have to vacate soon, asks himself, was I really so bad as all that? He is very upset that he did not win re-election. Fro Totenkinder, meanwhile, goes down into the dungeons in Fable Town and she tortures Baba Yaga and questions her. She asks her, Who is the adversary? The adversary's identity is still an unknown to all those in Fable Town. Elsewhere, a Monday reporter named Kevin Thorne, whom we briefly saw in the newsroom in Volume 4 after the Battle of Fable Town. Kevin, he wonders why it seems like no one but him seems to remember some of the events of that battle. Back at the hospital, Snow White, Bigby, and the others all admire their babies. When all of a sudden, the babies begin to levitate and fly in the hospital room. Fables 31, Mean Seasons Part 2 of 4, The Long Hard Fall, in which jobs and apartments are handed off, characters are forced to begin new chapters in their lives, and a severed, splintered head tells all. With Prince Charming as mayor now, Bigby and Snow White are preparing for the transition of their jobs to Beast and Beauty. Bigby, he is showing Beast around, showing him the ropes as he will be the new sheriff. Bigby, Beast, and Cinderella are interrogating a decapitated wooden soldier named Arlo. Arlo is spilling some information on the homelands. Arlo says... Father ordered all the gates to this world closed as quickly as we could find them. He's paranoid about an attack from the Monday world. Or worse, a secret influx of Monday technology that would play havoc with a delicate status quo. Elsewhere, Snow White is showing Beauty some of the ropes of being deputy mayor in the business office. We see Snow White has her children in the business office. They are tied to ropes so they can't float away as they can fly now. Luckily, as of this moment, they are all sleeping. Snow White tells Beauty that she should keep Boy Blue and Buffkin on staff. She says, Between the two of them, they know where everything is and everything that needs to be done to keep the day-to-day -day tasks running smoothly. And that leaves you free to deal with any crises that come up. And believe me, they do come up with alarming frequency. Meanwhile, King Cole sadly moves out of his penthouse since he is no longer mayor. 
as Prince Charming and Hobbs move in. Dr. Swineheart, after performing a few surgeries on Boy Blue, has finally fully healed up Boy Blue's hands. Boy Blue's hands were messed up ever since he was tortured by Baba Yaga, pretending to be Red Riding Hood. Later on, Bigby Beast and Cinderella return Arlo, the wooden soldier, back with the others. Tomorrow, they will start fresh on another one of the wooden soldiers. Bigby, he then walks with Beast. He's going to show Beast some more sheriff things Beast needs to know. As they are walking, Beast, he asks about Cinderella and what is the deal with her. Bigby tells Beast that Cinderella is one of the secrets he's going to have to learn to keep once he takes over as sheriff. Bigby explains his job as such. He says, You'll find out pretty quickly if you've got the temperament for this job. It's a pretty eclectic mix of small town sheriff and clandestine spy master. Bigby also tells Beast a big part of this job is learning to keep secrets. Things he won't even tell his wife or the mayor. Bigby says, Part of why Fable Town worked so well in the past is that I was willing to do all the dark things Snow and King Cole shouldn't have to know about and wouldn't want to know about. How Fable Town works in the future is substantially up to your ability to do the same. Bigby then introduces Beast to one of his big secrets, Gudrun, a.k.a. the goose that laid the golden egg. Beast, seeing the goose, asks, But you're supposed to be dead, killed in the homeland centuries ago. Well, Bigby and the goose came to an agreement. Her eggs provided Bigby with an untraceable source of funds for all of his covert spy activities. Bigby tells Beast that he has a person downtown that will convert the golden eggs into untraceable funds for him. Beast, he's starting to feel a little overwhelmed by all of this stuff. What has he gotten himself into? Bigby and Snow White discuss their future. Snow White is planning on going up to live on the farm because their children look like animals. And Bigby, he is not allowed up on the farm. But Bigby, he is also refusing to stay here in Fable Town. Snow White says that Fable Town needs him though, he can't leave. But Bigby argues, I faithfully served Fable Town for centuries. And for my troubles, my cubs are banished forever to the one place I'm not allowed to go. Nah. I've done my part, and more. That's enough. It's time for others to take their turn. Both of them share their frustrations that they can't be together. Snow White asks, how do we fix this? And Bigby answers, easy. Don't go to the farm. Come away with me. There are still forests in this world where no one will ever find us. We'd be free to raise our family without interference from Fable or Mundy. Snow White says that she can't do that. It would be a betrayal of Fable Town, and she can't live that way. The two of them, they say their goodbyes for now. Snow, she also says her goodbyes to all the others in Fable Town, and eventually she leaves to the farm with her children, while Bigby, he takes a cab and travels elsewhere. Eventually, Snow White arrives up on the farm. Her sister Rose Red is there to greet her. Rose Red is excited to meet all of her new nieces and nephews. Meanwhile, in Fable Town, Hobbs wakes up Prince Charming. Prince Charming is in bed with two women he picked up. Hobbs informs Charming that Boy Blue is gone, and Boy Blue also stole the Witching Cloak, the Vorpal Sword, and Pinocchio's body. Back at the farm, Snow White has a dream that night. Colin the Pig appears to her again. And Colin tells her that evil things are still to come in the future. Fables, Issue 32, Mean Seasons, Part 3 of 4, The Dark Killing Winter, in which protests occur, magical doings are arranged, someone dies, investigations proceed, and an unexpected visitor arrives at the farm. At a castle during winter, a fable named Mistral is flying around. Mistral is actually a flying gust of wind that can take solid form. Mistral and other gusts like him serve the North Wind. The North Wind, of course, is Bigby's father. Mistral excitedly flies over to the North Wind and informs him of what he saw in a scrying pool, about how the North Wind is a grandfather now. 
In Fable Town, protesters are upset about Prince Charming's many broken promises. And they are holding up signs that say things like, Keep your promises! Not so charming! We delivered the votes, now you deliver the spells! Beast, now acting as sheriff, is trying to keep the peace. The protesters, they want to have an appointment and talk with Charming in person. Beast tells them that, yes, you will have that. Just Boy Blue, he was usually the one that ran the business office and made all the appointments, and now things are a little chaotic without him. Beast, he eventually convinces the protesters to go home. He promises that they will have an appointment with the mayor in another day or two. Even though everything is a real shit show in Fable Town right now, Beast is proud because the angry protesters, as they were leaving, referred to him as Sheriff. They are beginning to accept him, even though they kind of hate him right now. Later, Fro Totenkinder is talking with Beast. Totenkinder and the other witches have finished a forensic examination of Beast's enchantment, and they improved it. So now Beast will be able to transform at will back and forth between human and beast form, and he will no longer be subjected to the moods of his wife, Beauty. Beast, he's happy. This will definitely help in the job. Totenkinder replies, Like Bigby, we need a tough customer for our sheriff. One who has the option of letting the monster out when a situation grows dire. In the business office, Beauty and Prince Charming are working away. Beauty is hella stressed. She hates this job. She wonders how Snow White ever did it. She asks, how did Snow run things so efficiently and keep things so tidy? Buffkin, he decides to answer and says, She was part of the government since before Fable Town was established. Back when they had dozens of people running this place, she had centuries to learn the ropes as she worked her way up to the top position. Beauty explains to Buffkin, It was a rhetorical question, Buffkin! And she shoes Buffkin away. Prince Charming tells Beauty, You're never going to get any work done if you keep fighting with that damned monkey every day. Beast, he reports into Prince Charming in the business office. Charming asks if Beast found anything out about Boy Blue's disappearance. It's been months. Beast answers, well, what I can prove is this. Blue stole the witching cloak with the Vorpal sword and Pinocchio's body. What I suspect is this. He's probably gone back to the homelands to deliver Pinocchio to Geppetto in return for Geppetto's help in freeing Red Riding Hood, the real one this time. The Witching Cloak allows him to teleport back to the homelands without an open gate to get there. In an unrelated matter, Beast reports that so far they discovered 36 treasure rooms in Bluebeard's apartment. Well, as of the latest inventory, it appears one of those rooms' treasures is all missing. Prince Charming asks, Someone stole one of my treasure rooms? I mean, one of our treasure rooms? How much money is missing? Beast he hesitates to answer because it is a lot. But after Prince Charming's insisting, Beast eventually says, Somewhere in the neighborhood of 2.4 to 6 billion dollars. Prince Charming says, B billion with a B? Beast explains that Bluebeard was very rich. Beast, he suspects that Jack took the money. He has no proof, but you know, Jack left town last fall and Bigby advised him to always suspect Jack first. Days pass. Mr. Webb, the husband of Little Miss Muffet, and the spider from her story, he thinks he hears a noise in his home. He shouts, I know someone's out here. You can't fool me, no sir. You damn kids with your pranks and rascally ways. All of a sudden, Mr. Webb starts struggling to breathe like the air has gotten sucked out of his lungs. As he gasps for air, he eventually dies. Up at the farm, the farm fables being led by Stinky the Badger are upset about Prince Charming's many broken promises, and they are venting. Clara the Raven asks Rose Red if she should step in, put a piece to all the scuffle going about. Rose tells her no, it's just a harmless gripe session. Let him blow off some steam. Snow White at the farm gets a letter from Fro Totenkinder from Fable Town. The letter reads, Dear Snow, Congratulations on the birth of your fine, healthy babies. But I caution you not to automatically assume that seven children is always a lucky number. Snow White wonders, how did Totenkinder get that wrong? She only has six children, not seven. Rose Red tells Snow, Nah, she's a dotty old hag. Life's too short to let shit like this worry you. 
Come in and get some hot cocoa while your munchkins play. Back to Fable Town. Dr. Swinehart, after investigating the body of Mr. Webb, says that Mr. Webb died of suffocation, but he does not know anything more than that. He also tells Beast that he doesn't know if Mr. Webb was murdered or died of natural causes. Days later, after conducting an autopsy, it is still inconclusive. Later on, Beast has a talk with Flycatcher. Flycatcher has been working in the business office uh, doing janitorial work as part of a community service term for all the flies he eats and keeps on eating. Bigby would always catch him eating more flies and punish him and tack on more community service hours. Well, Beast, after reading through Flycatcher's file, believes that this was unfair. Beast tells Flycatcher, I don't know why Bigby seemed to have such a huge personal nut against you, but I don't work that way. I think you'll find my style to be quite different, a lot less oppressive than my predecessor. So, as of this minute, I'm declaring all debts paid. You don't owe us another minute's worth of work. Congratulations, Fly. You're free to go. Flycatcher, for some reason, though, does not seem happy about this news. Beast doesn't recognize this, though, and just keeps on talking. He says he is pardoning all of Flycatcher's infractions. He tells him, don't worry, buddy. I'm prepared to look the other way at any new infractions, too. You don't have to worry about me hauling you back in here, not ever. And no more living on a cot in a corner of the boiler room. I already put your name on the waiting list for a Fable Town apartment. Beast, he then sends Flycatcher on his way and tells him to enjoy his new freedom. Flycatcher feels really lost, though. Without his duties and responsibility, what is he going to do? He actually really liked working as a janitor here. Up at the farm. The North Wind arrives. The North Wind tells Snow White and Rose Red, Greetings, Fables in Exile. Call me Mr. North. I'm Bigby Wolf's father. Now I'd like to see my grandchildren. Fables, issue 33. Mean Seasons, part 4 of 4 on Tell the Spring, in which bodies accumulate, the sheriff gets a good scolding, war is discussed, and a pack of floaters celebrate their first birthday. It is spring. Snow White and Bigby's children have learned to fly, and are nearing their first birthday. The North Wind and Snow White are walking and talking. The North Wind says that the children are extraordinary, but they require extraordinary training by him. They are learning to fly, sure, but not walk yet, and they still look inhuman. Snow White is confused. What can she do about that? They were born that way. This is when the North Wind explains, Well, you teach them to shapeshift, of course. If you wait too long, they won't be able to learn it. Bigby refused to be anything but a wolf, since he never much cared for me and took more to his mother. Before long, it was too late, and he was stuck in one shape, until you came along centuries later with that lycanthropy stained knife. My grandchildren should have at least learned to change between their basic human and wolf forms by now. The North Wind also asks, why aren't they talking yet? Snow says that they're all not even one years old yet. The North Wind explains they should be talking by their second month. Eventually, the two of them make their way to the town square up there at the farm. There is some commotion because apparently, Mary's little lamb has died. Mary and her lamb come from the nursery rhyme that goes like this. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. Mary had a little lamb as fleece was white as snow, etc, etc, etc. Well, Mary's lamb has died. Dr. Swinehart and Beast are investigating. The lamb died in a similar way as Mr. Webb did, suffocating to death, unable to breathe, all under strange circumstances. This lamb is actually victim number five that has died this way. The five victims, most of which were just mentioned but we never actually saw them die, are Mr. Webb, Sally Morrison, Barbara Allen, Jack Spratt, and now Mary's Little Lamb. Beast and Dr. Swinehart can't explain the deaths. The North Wind, listening to all this, can explain them, though. He says, it's a wild zephyr. The killer is a zephyr, a living gust of wind, much like my attendant winds, except this thing can't take solid form, so it's invisible. 
Beast and Swineheart think that this explanation kind of makes sense. Beast asks, but why would they kill? And how does it do it? The North Wind answers, they're foul, wild things. Not much more than beasts. Much like many of my kind, they like to feed off the air directly from a person's lungs. It is a particularly tasty delicacy for some of us. Unfortunately, it can suffocate the victim, especially if the Zephyr is careless or untrained. This one seems not to know or not to care about the mortal results of its feeding frenzies. They're rare, a corrupted version of my kind, usually created from some kind of extreme birth defect. We tend to kill them at nativity, but some do slip through the net. I'm surprised one could even come to exist in this mundane world. Prince Charming, who is there, he visited the farm to investigate this murder. He is listening to this, and he suspects that maybe the adversary is behind this, sent an invisible enemy to strike at them. It must be a response from the failed wooden soldier invasion from a year ago. Charming, he wants to strike back at the adversary. He says he is going to head back to Fable Town to convene a war council. He gives orders to Beast, though, to stay here and kill this Zephyr thing. The North Wind, he will assist. He sends his three Gust assistants to hunt down the Zephyr. He says, Mistral, Whiff, Squall, track the thing and snuff it out. We see back in Fable Town, without Flycatcher there to clean up the Woodland Luxury Apartment building, ever since Beast told him he was pardoned three months ago, the place has become a complete mess. Beauty looking around says, This place is an absolute pigsty. Looking at the floor, she comments she used to be able to see herself shine in the floors. Now the tile looks all brown and dingy. Later that day, Snow White comes with her six kids to the North Wind. The North Wind earlier offered to train the children. Well, Snow White wants to take him up on his offer, and she wants him to start immediately. Elsewhere on the farm, Rose Red and Beast are talking. Rose Red heard about Flycatcher, and she tells Beast to give Flycatcher his job back. Beast says that Bigby was keeping the poor sucker in perpetual servitude. Red Rose explains, Yeah, of course he was. That was the whole plan. Don't you get it? Don't you know anything? Flycatcher loves his job. He keeps everything clean and working in the woodland building. He's important because everyone counts on him. And you took all that away from him. Beast says, okay, so I'll give him his job back, but this time at a good wage, and not by piling up community service hours on him because of a ridiculous series of minor infractions. Rose Red explains, no, 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 that's not how this works. If Flycatcher has a job he can keep or quit at his own whim, then he has to quit, so he can try and get back to the homelands to find his wife and kids. But... If he's working off a series of never-ending punishment details, he isn't allowed to just walk away, so he gets to stay here without guilt and be safe and happy. Rose Red says that she heard rumors that Flycatcher is asking everyone around Fable Town constantly if they know of a gate still open to the homelands. She tells Beast to march home this instant. I mean, he is kind of useless here investigating Zephyrs, so he should march home this instant and arrest Flycatcher and put him back to work before Flycatcher goes off and does something stupid. In Snow White's room on the farm, the invisible wild Zephyr that has killed five fables comes to Snow White. It says to her, Mommy? The wild Zephyr is revealed to be Snow White and Bigby's seventh child, the one that Fro Totenkinder mentioned in the letter to Snow. This child will be known as Ghost. Snow White starts crying. She says, I knew you'd come. You've been trying to find me, haven't you, all this time all alone, not knowing how to feed yourself? Ghost asks, Why do you leave me, Mommy? Snow White answers, I didn't know. I thought I only had six children. I'm so sorry. We didn't see you, baby. Snow White tells Ghost, Listen, you can't take air directly from people anymore. Not animals either. Ghost says, but outside air tastes so bad. Snow White replies, I know baby, but you have to promise me no more inside air. 
Snow White also tells Ghost that he can't stay here. He has to go and find his father, Bigby, as everyone will be looking for him. And if they find him, they will kill him. Bigby will know what to do. Ghost, Ghost is going to leave, but he says, Sorry I was bad, Mommy. Snow replies, Hurry and go fast, fast as you can, before they catch you. In the aftermath of all this, life goes on. It is finally the one-year birthday party for Snow White's children. She gives all the children cupcakes and presents. She also puts out seven little birthday cakes. Rose Red asks, why seven cakes? Snow White explains it away as, yep, I'm uh, starting a family tradition. Snow White then turns to her children and says, which I'll explain to you messy little monsters when you're older. Now, let's open presents. And with the Wolf Cubs' first birthday party, we end Volume 5, Mean Seasons. All right, so that was Fables Volume 5. So while not as amazing as the last one was, I think there was still some good stuff in here. I thought the Cinderella storyline was fun, seeing her be this badass spy and manipulating Ichabod Crane and getting information from him. I thought Ichabod Crane was actually kind of fun in a way, too. He got Me too by Snow White, so he was doing some bad stuff there. He also embezzled funds from Fable Town, so that's why he got kicked out. And he got his comeuppance in the end from Big B. So that was cool stuff. The Big B in World War II storyline was also kind of amusing, seeing Big B go toe-to-toe -to -toe with some Nazis, as well as Frankenstein. Although I will say that one was a little bit of a filler storyline, and not that important to the overall Fables story going on. The Mean Season story arc was good. I liked the results of the mayoral election. Of course, Prince Charming won. He was promising so much. Although we now learn he won't be able to fulfill most of those promises because the witches can't just pump out more glamour. So it's going to be fun to see how that pays off. We have Beast being sheriff now and Beauty being the deputy mayor. So it's an interesting status quo shift for future volumes. And we also had the birth of Bigby and Snow White's kids and got to meet them. It was kind of amusing that there was actually six of them. Well, actually a seventh one if you count the wind. <laughs> child of theirs so yeah so many kids so that's pretty fun and uh that one child the gust of wind child accidentally killing people and uh, being forced to flee the farm uh is going to be pretty interesting to see pay off in the future so yeah good stuff in here i'm going to give this volume an 8 out of 10 thank you all for watching let me know your thoughts in the comments and next volume is going to be a really big one we are going to finally find out the identity of the adversary. So really excited for the next volume. I will see you all then there for that.